In this example, we're going to be using conservation of energy and we're also going to be using an energy balance in order to determine the work done in raising this tractor up a slope whilst increasing its velocity. So on the left hand side we have a tractor and that tractor has an initial velocity of 3.5 meters per second. The tractor then ascends up an incline and the incline has a length or a distance of 45 meters and that incline is at a gradient of 4.5 degrees. So it should already be evident that the tractor is going to gain potential energy. But in addition to gaining potential energy, it's also going to gain additional kinetic energy. Now the reason why it's additional kinetic energy is because it's already going to have kinetic energy at the bottom of the slope. It already has a mass and a velocity. In addition to gaining potential energy and kinetic energy, we're also going to need to do additional work in order to overcome this resistive force. Now this might be a force due to drag or due to friction, but additional work is going to need to be done in order to overcome that effect as well. Now we have quite a lot of data on the screen, so I'm just going to explain this. First of all, we have M subscript T, which is the total mass of the tractor. We then have MR and RR, and these are for the rear wheels of the tractor. So we have the mass of the rear wheels and the radius of the rear wheels. But as you've probably seen a tractor before, the front wheels are smaller than the rear wheels. So we also have the mass of the front wheels and we have the radius of the front wheels. Now it is important to point out that the masses that are given there are for both wheels. So it may be easier to think of this as the mass of the rear wheels and the axle, and the same for the front wheels. That's the mass of both wheels. Now once again, there's a number of different ways of approaching this type of question. We know that the tractor at the bottom of the slope is going to have a certain amount of energy, E1. And we also know that when it gets to the top of the slope, it's going to have a certain amount of energy, E2. Now E2 is going to be greater than E1 because it's gaining kinetic energy and it's also gaining potential energy. So therefore we could think of the work done or the amount of energy we need to put into the system to keep it in balance is the energy at the end minus the energy at the start. The slight problem with that approach is that the work done to overcome our resistive force also needs to be accounted for. So I'm going to set this up slightly differently. And I'm going to specify the following. The work done, that's the amount of energy we're putting into the system, equals the change in potential energy plus the change in kinetic energy plus the work done to overcome our resistance. Okay, now we can substitute in for each of those terms because the total work done is the change in potential energy. Well, change in potential energy is mass times gravity times the change in height. And the change in kinetic energy is the half times the mass. And we have to be a little bit careful here because it's the change in the velocity squared. Recall that kinetic energy is a half mv squared. And we'll see why it's important to put the v squared in brackets in a moment. And then plus the work done to overcome friction. Well, we have a formula for work. Work is just force times distance. So plus force times distance. And we'll use our actual terms in a moment because our force is actually r. It's a resistive force. But if we start with the general form, it'll make things a little bit easier. Now, hopefully what you've picked up on here is that we've included the effects due to the change in linear kinetic energy only here. And we also need to include the effects of the change in angular kinetic energy. We can see that our tractor's gaining linear kinetic energy because it's traveling faster at the top of the slope than the bottom of the slope. But that also means that each of our wheels are going to be traveling faster or with a greater angular velocity when we reach the top of the slope. Therefore, we need to add in another term, a half i 
and again change in angular velocity squared. We treat that in the same way as we do the linear velocity like so. OK, next I'm going to rewrite the formula, but I'm going to substitute our variables into this general form of the equation. Now the first term there is the change in potential energy, and we can see that the whole of the tractor is being lifted up the slope. Therefore the mass that we need to use is the total mass of the tractor. We have gravity, and we have change in height. Now again, for the linear kinetic energy, we can see that all of the tractor is gaining linear kinetic energy. So it's going to be a half times the total mass of the tractor times the change in linear velocity squared. Next, I'm going to do my angular kinetic energy terms. And we're actually going to have two of these because in one instance we have angular kinetic energy in the rear wheels and the rear axle, but we also have angular kinetic energy in the front wheels and the front axle. So we have plus a half, let's do the rear wheels first, so we're going to have I for the rear wheels, times the change in angular velocity of the rear wheels. So it's the rear wheels angular velocity squared like so. We need to do the same for the front wheels. So we have the moment of inertia of the front wheels times the change in the angular velocity of the front wheels squared. And then we're going to need to add force times distance for our resistive force. Well, our resistive force is R and our distance is D. So we have quite a long formula there, but hopefully the process is logical. We have a change in potential energy, we have a change in linear kinetic energy, and we have change in angular kinetic energy for both the rear and the front axles, but we're also doing work to overcome friction. Okay, let's calculate some of our additional parameters, and then we can start substituting into our formula. So as we move from left to right in our formula, the first thing that we need to determine is the change in height. Now to determine our change in height, we can see that we have a triangle. We know that the hypotenuse of that triangle is D, which is 45 meters. And we know that the angle is 4.5 degrees. But what we need to find is the vertical change in height here, H. We're well, using trigonometry, we can see that we have a triangle. The length that we're trying to find is opposite the angle. So we have sine theta, or sine of the angle, equals opposite over hypotenuse, or opposite equals hypotenuse sine theta. If we relate this to our question, the opposite is the height h. So we can say, that h equals 45 for the hypotenuse sine 4.5 degrees. Therefore, the value of h equals 3.531 meters. Accurate to three decimal places. If we continue moving left to right, in our second term, we know the mass of our tractor and we know our two velocities. In the third term, we don't yet know the moment of inertia of the rear wheels. And we don't yet know the angular velocities for the rear wheels. And there's going to be two of those, omega 1 for the rear wheels and omega 2 for the rear wheels. When we get to the next term, we have exactly the same problem. We don't yet know the moment of inertia for the front wheels, and we don't yet know the beginning and end angular velocities for the front wheels. So let's calculate each of those things now. So for the rear wheels, our moment of inertia is a half mr squared. We need to use the mass of the rear wheels and the radius of the rear wheels, and the formula that we're using there is the formula for moment of inertia for a solid cylinder. 
In effect, we're assuming that our wheels have been combined into a single cylinder. So we have a half times the mass of the rear wheels, which is 850, times the radius of the rear wheels, which is 0.85 squared, giving us a moment of inertia for the rear wheels equal to 307.06. Kilogram meter squared, accurate to two decimal places. And let's repeat that for our front wheels. So we have the front wheels equals a half times the mass of the front wheels, 275, times the radius of the front wheels, 0.45 squared, giving us a moment of inertia for the front wheels equal to 27.84. Kilogram meter squared, again to two decimal places. So we have a height of 3.531 meters. We have a moment of inertia for the rear wheels of 307.06, and we have a moment of inertia for the front wheels equal to 27.84. I'm just going to collect that data at the top of the page and then carry on with the next set of calculations. OK, so next we can move on and calculate our angular velocities. And I need to calculate the initial angular velocity for the rear wheels. I need to calculate the final angular velocity for the rear wheels. I need to calculate the initial angular velocity for the front wheels. And I need to calculate the final angular velocity for the front wheels. Now, fortunately, this is a relatively straightforward calculation because we have the formula V equals R omega. Therefore, omega dividing each side by R just equals V over R. We just need to take care here. If we're doing the calculations for the rear wheels, then R in this formula is going to be the radius of the rear wheels. And if we're doing the calculations for the front wheels, then R is going to be R for the front wheels. So V over R. So for omega 1, for the rear wheels, we have 3.5 over 0.85. For omega 2, for the rear wheels, we have the upper velocity, 12.5 over the radius of the rear wheels. Omega 1 for the front wheels is going to be the initial linear velocity divided by the radius of 0.45 and the same method for the final velocity of the front wheels 12.5 over 0.45. Now running each of those through the calculator we get 4.118 for omega 1 on the rear wheels that's rads per second, accurate to three decimal places. 14.706 for omega 2 on the rear wheels. 7.778 for omega 1 on the front wheels. Note that they're moving at a higher rotational speed because they're smaller wheels. And 27.778 for the final angular velocity of the front wheels. Now I appreciate that there's quite a few steps here, but hopefully the sequence of what we're doing is logical. We need to calculate all of these components so that we can input them into the final equation in a moment. So once again, I'm going to move all of those values to the top and create some space. And now it's just a case of plugging everything into our final formula. And we need to take a lot of care here because there's a lot of potential to make mistakes. If you prefer, you could calculate your change in potential energy term, and then you could calculate your change in linear velocity term, and then you could calculate your change in angular kinetic energy term for the rear wheels, then do the same for the front wheels, and then calculate the work done to overcome friction, and then add each of those terms together at the end. You can break this down into as many steps as you want. 
So we have the work done equals the mass of the tractor, 6525, times gravity, 9.81, times our change in height at the top, 3.531, plus a half times the mass of the tractor, 6525, times the change in the linear velocities squared. Now the way that we need to write this is as follows, 12.5 squared minus 3.5 squared. So it's the change in the squared values. That's not the same as the square of the change of the velocities. So what I mean is 12.5 squared minus 3.5 squared, like so, is not equal to 12.5 minus 3.5 all squared. So you need to take care there. It's the change in the squared values, as we have written. Now the same is true for our change in angular kinetic energy. We have a half IR three zero seven point zero six times the change in the angular velocities squared. Well omega two for the rear wheels is fourteen point seven oh six squared minus omega one for the rear wheels. 4.118 squared. We need to do the same for the front wheels, so a half times i for the front wheels, 27.84 times the change in those velocities squared, so 27.778 squared minus 7.778 squared and finally for our force times our distance the work done to overcome friction we have 65 times the distance traveled which is 45 meters now i'm going to run all of that through the calculator and you may want to check this for yourself but i come out with a value of the work done equal to 739,244 now I'm going to convert that to kilojoules. So what I get is 739.2 kilojoules. So the work done to increase the potential energy of the tractor by lifting it up and to increase the linear kinetic energy of the tractor as its velocity increases, as well as increasing the angular kinetic energy of the rear wheels and the front wheels, plus the work done to overcome friction gives us a total work done of 739.2 kilojoules. Now I appreciate that there's quite a few steps there, but providing you understand the principles of conservation of energy, and you work systematically through this type of problem, then you should be able to do similar calculations for yourselves. As mentioned, there are a number of approaches. There's no need necessarily to save all of your calculations till the final line like I've done here. You could calculate your change in your potential energy you're changing your linear kinetic energy, you're changing your angular kinetic energy, and the work done to overcome friction separately, and then just add all of those values together at the end.